Good evening, I'm Asha Tomlinson. Adrian and Andrew are on assignment. Tonight, officials in Kelowna confirm yesterday's crane collapse killed five people. Lives have been lost doing their job. The reaction and the investigation. Also tonight, under scrutiny, a lawyer steps aside after admitting he had a private investigator follow a judge. It is unchartered waters for us. We, we need this kind of behavior to uh, cease. Another First Nation reports a grim discovery. Some of these children attempted to, to get away by just swimming. And Canada's largest Olympic team in nearly 40 years includes a familiar face. I finally come out the other end of stressing about the Olympics and stressing about everything. Can Penny Alexiak rule the pool again? This is The National. We begin tonight in Kelowna, BC, where a local state of emergency remains in effect. The community is still in shock after yesterday's deadly collapse of a construction crane. Today, it still rests mangled across the construction site. As the RCMP confirmed, four subcontractors were killed when it fell. Two of them, brothers. A fifth man working in a neighboring office building is presumed dead. Officers are working to retrieve his body from the rubble. Before it collapsed, workers had been gearing up to dismantle it, but we still don't know exactly why it came down. Here's Susanna De Silva with the latest on the investigation. Quiet examinations today of this scene of deadly destruction yesterday that thankfully wasn't even worse. Uh, I think we're very fortunate that no other lives have been lost, no rescuers were, work, were, were injured, and we want to keep it that way. We want to make sure it takes whatever time using engineers and experts to ensure that we do this as safely as possible. Two of the five victims, brothers Patrick and Eric Stemmer, are being remembered online with GoFundMe sites set up to support their young families. Their family owns a construction company in the small community of Salmon Arm. Patrick Stemmer had just recently posted videos of the crane working on the Kelowna building. It's hard. It's really hard. These are people, hard, lovely, hardworking people. And they, you know, lives have been lost doing their job. Neighbors say they had gotten to know some of those working on the site, even asking questions of the crane operators and how they did their job. He went up there and he inspected everything on the way up. Um, and sometimes if we were out in the front, you know, he might be see us beginning and have a little wave or something, you know. Those who witnessed the accident still find it hard to believe. The speed at which that sort of catastrophic event happened where the you know, the, the crane uh, broke away and fell as, as so fast that no one could have uh, really gotten out of its way. Engineers are trying to secure what is still standing to safely retrieve the fifth body and then begin what will be a lengthy investigation. Well, it's a tedious process. There's a set procedure. Those who investigate crane accidents say as they are being dismantled, there is a set system and that some of the cranes do collect data about conditions like wind. The crane will tell you what happened along with the statement. Get the statements from the people before they have an opportunity to talk to each other. Susanna, what do we know about the effort to retrieve the body of the latest victim? Well, Vancouver's heavy urban search and rescue team was asked to assist. They arrived in Kelowna tonight. They will be evaluating the scene and determining when it is safe for them to be able to go in and retrieve that body. At that point, the city may then look at allowing some of those residents and buildings, uh, to, businesses rather, to come back in. The area is still evacuated around that. Then the RCMP will lead the investigation to determine nothing criminal happened, and WorkSafe BC will look into it to figure out exactly what went wrong. Asha. Susanna De Silva in Vancouver. Thanks for this. More than 300 wildfires continue to rage across British Columbia tonight. New evacuation orders have come into effect in the Kamloops area today. The flames there have scorched over 40,000 hectares. 20 fires have started over the last two days alone, and there's no let up in sight. Officials warn more could erupt as temperatures stay up. 
Dozens of wildfires are also burning in northern Ontario, where a group of 49 First Nations is calling on the province to declare a state of emergency. Evacuation efforts are underway in several communities. The province says it has been in contact with local leaders. There's been another reported discovery of unmarked graves near the site of a former residential school. A BC First Nation says more than 160 have been found on Penelicate Island. It sits among the southern Gulf Islands off the coast of BC. For nearly a century, it was home to the Cooper Island Industrial School operated by the Catholic Church. Karen Pauls has the story. <laughs> Ray Tony Charlie looks towards the site of the former Cooper Island Residential School. He was forced to attend there as a teenager and he believes the number reported may be low. They were just tossed into the water there too. The National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation has documentation on 121 students who died at the school, but the lead archivist doesn't doubt there are more. Some of these children attempted to, to get away by just, you know, swimming or you know, trying to get off the island. He hopes to identify more children when the Catholic order that ran the school finally provides more documents. There's so many unanswered questions that our membership wants. This is the latest in a series of grim announcements linked to former residential schools. On Thursday, the Tecumloops to Shkwepmik First Nation near Kamloops will reveal more details of its discovery of the buried remains of an estimated 215 children. In Saskatchewan, 751 unmarked graves have been reported, although it's not known yet how many residential school students are among that number. BC has committed $12 million to help search for unmarked graves. But it would be, uh, I think, premature for us to uh, do anything other than to await uh, the direction of the community. The Prime Minister said Ottawa will also support the Penelicate tribe in its search for answers. We cannot bring back those who were lost, but we can and we will continue to tell the truth. That's not good enough for Steve Sweetholt. He was at the school in the 1970s and has relatives who died there. I don't see the Prime Minister doing much in reference to uh, holding anybody to account other than uh, you know, dropping by and uh, saying a few words and putting a teddy bear down. I think uh, you know, we're past that. Penelicate leaders are encouraging residential school survivors to attend healing sessions because they say more unmarked graves may yet be discovered. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Vancouver. An update now to a story we brought you last night. A lawyer who hired a private investigator to spy on a Manitoba judge has left his job and is under investigation. As Cameron McIntosh shows us, questions are now swirling about who else he may have been watching. It's not clear if they got anything, but it appears Manitoba's premier was also a target of a surveillance scheme designed to undermine provincial health orders. We know as well that uh, there's been similar attempts to surveil the Premier. Manitoba's Justice Minister isn't saying who's responsible, but it comes after an admission yesterday from Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms President John Carpe, who said he had Manitoba's Chief Justice Glenn Joyal followed in an attempt to find him and other public health officials flouting health orders, as Joyal presided over the Centre's constitutional challenge of Manitoba's COVID restrictions. If this was done, in order to intimidate, uh, it is uncharted waters for us. We, we need this kind of behaviour to uh, cease. Carpe went on indefinite leave today, while his organization's board said it was unaware of what he had done. The Justice Centre has been fighting COVID restrictions across the country, including the challenge in Manitoba from seven rural churches. A libertarian and socially conservative-leaning advocacy group, it's also a charity whose status may now face tough questions after spying on a judge, says this expert. I think that uh, certainly the organization is going to have to do some thinking around whether it should be a charity. Meanwhile, complaints against Carpe and two others have been made to the Manitoba and Alberta Law Societies by this lawyer. If the complaints are substantiated, uh, there will be serious consequences up to and including disbarment. Winnipeg police are also investigating if any of this is criminal. Friesen isn't ruling out contempt of court charges. I would say everything's on the table. Uh, clearly, I believe that accountability is necessary. So as for how many people were actually surveilled and what will happen to any information that was gathered, the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms isn't responding, saying only in a statement that it doesn't spy on public officials. At least, not anymore. 
Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Political tension in Haiti shows no sign of letting up. The country was plunged into turmoil last week with the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. He was shot at his home by what officials say was a group of foreign trained killers. The instability since then has been fueled by hunger and widespread gang violence. Haiti has asked for military help from the United Nations and the U.S. to secure the country. As members of Canada's Haitian community watch the situation from afar, there's a growing fear for loved ones who have been waiting to join them in this country. Now, as Sarah Levitt explains, they want Canada's immigration process to help out by speeding up. Slandi Edouard says she's scared for her family. I call every day to make sure they're still alive, she says, of her two sons, five and eight, living with their grandmother in Haiti. Edouard was granted refugee status after using an illegal border crossing from the U.S. Now she's waiting for permanent residency. But with the assassination of the Haitian president and the unrest that's followed, she's worried. People will take advantage of having no president, she says. We are, like everybody else, afraid that the country will go into chaos. And we have all our clients that are waiting for their family members. Now lawyers and Haitian community members have appealed to Immigration Canada, calling for family reunification to be fast-tracked for refugees seeking permanent residency. Most of the people who are here have been recognized as refugees, meaning that uh, the tribunal has recognized they have a credible fear of persecution if they return, and therefore their family members might have a risk because of that, in addition to the risk caused by the insecurity of the country. Other advocates, though, say they want the same consideration for those whose refugee status has yet to be determined. I think we have a program that can be said, you know what, you have contributed economically, you have contributed uh, culturally, welcome to Canada, a true welcome to Canada. The federal immigration ministry did not respond to interview requests. As for Edouard, Ça fait la moitié de sa vie, je suis pas là. I've been gone for half of his life, she says, of her youngest son, something she hopes will soon change. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. At least one man died in the protests that erupted across Cuba on Sunday. The state-run news agency says several people were also injured. <laughs> and there are also unofficial reports saying more than 100 people have been arrested or are missing. People are angry about food shortages and high prices during the pandemic. Supporters in the U.S. are keeping up their protests. In Miami, they blocked off a six-lane highway for hours. In South Africa, meanwhile, protests are more violent since the jailing of former President Jacob Zuma last week. More than 70 people have died as political anger fuses with economic desperation and resentment over the country's handling of the COVID-19 crisis. Sasha Petrasek looks at the latest. In the past days, looting has spread from stores to factories and warehouses ransacking and rioting in South Africa's worst violence since apartheid. From the eastern provinces of KwaZulu-Natal to Johannesburg's economic hub. All of the doors are open. People are walking in. Highways on fire, skies full of smoke. The police hopelessly outnumbered. Protests started with the jailing of former South African President Jacob Zuma last Wednesday, accused of corruption. His supporters see his treatment as a symbol of the current government's repression. If they release Zuma, he says, we would be free. Until then, we keep protesting. But over the weekend, this spark ignited frustration with years of economic hardship, unemployment at 32 percent, and months of pandemic restrictions. And now the prospect of food shortages and hunger. This is very painful, and I don't know what can I say about that. This is not our fault. I don't know what happened to the government. We don't know, but this is not our fault. The government calls the riots nothing more than chaos caused by criminals. There is no grievance, no any political cause 
that can justify the violence and the destruction. But now it's under fire for not mobilizing nearly as many security forces to tackle this crisis as it did to enforce pandemic lockdowns just a few weeks ago. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. It's been six months since Joe Biden was sworn in as U.S. president, and many Republicans are still clinging to the false claims that the election was rigged. They've been introducing new voting rules in several states. Today, in a highly dramatic move, Texas Democrats went to Washington to send a message about it. Judy Trin has the story. The big lie is just that, a big lie. In the birthplace of America, President Biden attacked former President Trump and his supporters who claimed the 2020 election was stolen. That's not statesmanship. That's not statesmanship. That's selfishness. That's not democracy. It's a denial of the right to vote. Last November, a record number of Americans voted. But since then, 17 states, mainly Republican-controlled, have passed laws to limit voting. The most recent, Texas, wants to reduce voting hours, limit mail-in ballots, and get rid of drive through polls. Republicans say it's to prevent voter fraud. Democrats say it suppresses the votes of people of color in poor communities. We are not going to buckle to the big lie in the state of Texas. The big lie that has resulted that has resulted in anti-democratic legislation. 59 Democrats refused to show up to vote on the bill, instead flying to Washington to plead for help from the White House. And you are doing this in support and in defense of some of our nation's highest ideals. Setting up a showdown in Texas. They will be arrested. They will be cabined inside the Texas Capitol until they get their job done. Experts say this unfolding political drama could raise public awareness. Um, a lot of these changes happen under the radar or are hard to follow. And if you get people talking about them, then maybe they can, you know, call their state legislator and say, you know, hey, maybe the Democrats are right to be um, objecting this. It's unlikely Biden's words will impact what happens in the Texas Capitol. The Republicans control the state legislature and experts say the chances that this political theater will result in a new federal law are slim. Judy Trin, CBC News, Washington. Canadians suffering a mental health crisis have little option but to call police. But that has led to tragedy. Because I made that 911 call, I initially killed my son. Coming up, Saskatchewan RCMP are piloting a new approach. Will it save lives? Plus, confusion over mixed doses. There is limited data on mix and match. Our doctor explains comments taken out of context and what we actually know about mixing vaccines. But first. One day, dear boy, you shall be king. Streaming is the word at the Emmys. We'll tell you which shows are dominating the knobs. An unauthorized Celine Dion biopic opened at the Cannes Film Festival tonight. The French drama Aline was inspired by the life of the Quebecois superstar, but changes names and certain events. Dion did not officially endorse the movie, but its creator says she gave her blessing through her French manager. Nominees for this year's Emmys were announced today, and streaming services have once again dominated the list. Your Majesty. Netflix's The Crown sits atop alongside The Mandalorian from Disney Plus. Wherever I go, he goes. They each racked up 24 nominations, reinforcing the rapid rise of streaming. They are an unusual couple, you know. Not far behind, with 23 noms, Marvel's WandaVision, which also airs on Disney Plus. Am I dead? No. Of the top three categories, drama, comedy, and limited series, just one network show was nominated. Let's see what's down here. Among the Canadians vying for an Emmy, Schitt's Creek co-creator and star Dan Levy. 
dad? It's not for his work on the hit show, but for outstanding guest actor in a comedy series hosting an episode of Saturday Night Live. Look at you! And a little history was made, too. Y'all need to trust this mother's intuition. Pose star MJ Rodriguez picked up a nomination in the lead drama actress category, becoming the first transgender performer up for a major acting Emmy. After a sluggish start, Canada's COVID-19 vaccination roared past a key milestone this week. After crossing the midway point yesterday, the number of eligible Canadians fully vaccinated now sits at just over 51%. Over 17 million Canadians, 12 and older, have had their second shot. The number of eligible Canadians who've had one dose is now closing in on 80%. And some clarification from health experts today after the way comments from the WHO's chief scientist were reported yesterday. Some Canadians found her remarks about mixing vaccines confusing. It will be a chaotic situation in countries if citizens start, you know, deciding when and who uh, they should be taking a second or a third or a fourth dose. You need boosters Today, the WHO clarified that it meant individuals should not decide for themselves and should instead listen to their public health agency's advice. Canadian health officials say the comments were actually meant to address concern about a rush on vaccine supply and global equity. They remind Canadians that mixing vaccines is safe and effective. For more on this, we're joined by Dr. Isaac Bogosh, part of Ontario's Vaccine Distribution Task Force and an infectious disease specialist joining us from Vancouver. Dr. Bogosh, the misinterpretation of the WHO's message yesterday really caused some distress for Canadians who have mixed their first and second doses of the vaccine. Can you clarify the WHO's message? Yeah, absolutely, and I'm glad they clarified it as well. Basically, they're stating that it is okay to mix and match vaccines. What they were referring to yesterday was people who have completed a full vaccine series and then have started adding extra vaccines on top of that and doing this under their own volition, not under the guidance of public health, which, of course, we shouldn't be doing. Uh, they clarified that today, and they basically suggested that uh, there is evidence for mixing and matching vaccines, at least there is growing evidence on that front, and that people should adhere to their public health guidance, which we're doing in Canada. We certainly know that there's many countries around the world, Canada included, that are mis mixing and matching first and second doses of vaccines and are doing so safely. Right, and we're hearing about booster shots, a third dose of the vaccine. What do we know about that for Canadians right now? Yeah, we have to timestamp all of these conversations, but when we look at currently, right now, it does not appear that there's a need for a booster vaccine for the general population if you've completed your vaccine series. Now, that might not be true later on. We have to be aware that there may be a need later on down the line, but we don't need one now for the current uh, COVID-19 that's circulating, including the Delta variant. There may be a smaller segment of the population who are immunocompromised who might need a booster vaccine, but certainly for everybody, uh, that's not necessary at this moment in time. Dr. Bogosh, thank you. My pleasure. In France, people are suddenly rushing to get vaccinated. In less than a day, more than one million people made appointments, and today was a record for shots administered. In a televised speech last night, the president warned of restrictions for those who don't get the shot. Starting in August, a special pass will be required to enter restaurants, malls, to get on trains and planes. France has given nearly half of its population at least one dose. 37% are fully vaccinated. Next on The National, a frightening situation for people in mental health distress. Oh, Open the door now! Saskatchewan police are looking to change the way the res they respond to crisis calls. Plus... I come from, um, from a reserve where we have very poor internet access. The demand for Indigenous products is rising, but the access to technology remains low. Stay with us. Welcome back. For 911 calls involving people struggling with mental health issues, who is on the other end of the line can make all the difference. Sometimes a police response isn't the right one. That's the message of a new pilot project by Saskatchewan RCMP. Bonnie Allen takes us through how it's helping and who needs it most. Jonas Hardlot was in mental distress last August and asking for help, but this isn't what he was looking for. Open the door now! Did I open the door? No. What the f 
clinic is here to check on you. Open the door. I'm coming back with a sledgehammer. Inside the house, the 34-year-old was coming off a binge of booze and drugs after losing his job and getting in a car accident. Hardlot, who suffers from depression and anxiety, had started cutting himself with a razor. I cut myself and I, I tried to call mental health that morning. And like I said, they tried to give me a run around when I need to speak to somebody right away. So his mother-in-law called 911. Open the door now! But Hardlot didn't want the RCMP at his door. There's been people that have been shot just for being mentally distraught and officers not knowing, okay, this guy just f***ed up on drugs and alcohol and they, little do they know that maybe that's a cry for help. And what was the officer's demeanor when he arrived at your door? Straight aggression. The RCMP in Saskatchewan respond to thousands of mental health calls a year. We're trained to help, you know, how to de-escalate situations <clears throat> that involve mental health, but we're not professionals and we know that. So the police force has launched a one-year pilot project in Saskatchewan, placing psychiatric nurses in the emergency call centre. They're taking 911 calls from people in mental distress and have access to their medical records. They're also coaching officers who need expert advice. Sergeant Burton Jones says the first 50 phone calls showed promising results. There were 17 times where police did not have to make an arrest and did not have to take that person to you know, the hospital in handcuffs or into our cells in handcuffs or anything like that. The nurse was able to intervene and do, a, do an assessment, do a referral, things like that, hook them up with uh, community resources. So never had to do our old-fashioned way, which is apprehend, go to the hospital, sit and wait. He's diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Oh. For years, city police departments in Canada have been setting up specialized crisis units that pair police officers with mental health professionals. But the RCMP says this approach will improve service to rural and remote areas. A first of its kind in Canada, it's modeled after the system in the United Kingdom where police are not expected to be the first or only response to mental health calls, something mental health organizations here have been calling for. Uh, we, we wanted to decrease the reliance on only sending police um, to really make sure that we're sending other kinds of resources. And that's why this is a step. Um, to broadening or expanding what help is available. What policies were missed? What, what gaps are there? Kerry Rigby Wilcox's son Stephen was shot and killed by police in 2018. He suffered from alcoholism, anxiety and depression. Health records show he had suicidal intent, including provoking police to shoot him. His mother says police on scene didn't know that the night he died. And if they were given that opportunity to understand that this is a potential suicide by cop and uh, they might actually handle it different. Last month, a coroner's inquest into her son's death recommended more mental health training for the RCMP and Saskatoon police. Rigby Wilcox says a psychiatric nurse inside the RCMP call centre who could access her son's medical history would have also helped. I did call 911 to get help to keep my son alive and in the end that didn't happen and so my blame is on myself and I feel like because I made that 911 call I initially killed my son. Open the door now! In this case, Jonas Hardlot did get medical help and the RCMP officer seen in this video was reassigned. But Hardlot understands police are put in difficult situations. Everybody needs understanding, right? Nobody is. We're all human. He hopes this pilot project will be made permanent and will make a difference for everyone. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. And an Olympic champion is also opening up about her struggles with mental health. I was literally like crying at trials every day. Coming up, Penny Oleksiak on the pressures to stay at the top of her game as we near the Tokyo Olympics. Stay with us. Despite the pandemic, Canada will send its largest Olympic team to Tokyo since 1984. 
371 athletes will compete, the vast majority from Ontario, BC and Quebec. 60% are women. The youngest member of the team will be 14-year-old swimmer Summer McIntosh. And another swimming superstar we're all watching, Penny Oleksiak. She blew the competition out of the water at the 2016 Olympics, but she says her victories in the pool came with a cost to her mental health. Adrian recently talked to Canada's champion swimmer about preparing through a pandemic and the pressure of being a breakout Olympian. Here again is their conversation. Penny Oleksiak. Penny Oleksiak's first major international swim meet happened to be the 2016 Rio Olympics, and she ruled Rio. Canada in third with Penny Oleksiak. Penny Oleksiak, silver medal. Oh, that's incredible, 16-year-old. Canada's going to medal in this. Becoming Canada's youngest Olympic champion, winning more medals in one summer games than any other Canadian ever, all just after turning 16 years old. Brazil must have seemed a blur to the Toronto teenager who swears she didn't go to the games with big expectations. Honestly, the last 15 meters, I put my head down and I bit my lip and I was just going as hard as I could. But she became such a household name so fast. It was, it seemed, a national campaign to have her name the country's flag bearer at the closing ceremony. Imagine that on your resume before you even have your driver's license. Imagine life after. Penny Alexiak and I sat down virtually to talk of pressure and performance. How are you feeling? Like, what's what is today like for you? Um, today it's rainy in Toronto. All I want to do is like sleep all day. Um, but no, overall, I'm feeling pretty good. Like I have been for the last little while. I think I've finally come out the other end of stressing about the Olympics and stressing about everything. What was happening? After 2016, there was a lot of pressure on every meet I went to. I was expected to win every race I did. I had to win. People were always, it kind of felt like people were always watching me and I always had to be the best. And no matter what I did, it wasn't good enough for myself really. And like, I thought it wasn't good enough for other people, even though I was told otherwise, but like, Mentally, my brain was kind of just in that mindset of like, you have to win. And if you don't win, you, like you've lost, you're a loser, you're, you, you're never going to be good again at what you do, you know? And it was something that I was like suppressing for a while. When you're in the middle of something like that, it must feel like a storm. I just like remember doing interviews and people like talking to me about Rio and I, my mind was so past Rio at that point that I was like, no, right now I'm not the best I could be, even though people keep saying like, champion like olympic champion i'm like no that wasn't where my mindset was in the moment and alexia has the gold medal it was a whirlwind after the olympics sponsors everywhere appearances all the time growing up with a brother in the nhl she knew all about the spotlight but the toll of everything crept up she pulled out of the 2018 Pan Pacific Championships, still smiling for fans, but struggling terribly inside. I don't think I've ever talked about this ever, but I was literally like crying at trials every day. Like there's photos on Twitter of like people who wanted to come up and take photos with me. And I was like, just finished crying. And I was like smiling so crazy. But I remember like being on the phone with my mom and I was like, I don't know what I want to do. And she's like, you don't have to go to these major meets you know that and you can take the month off go somewhere with your sister and that's literally exactly what I did I was like I need time for myself because I hadn't taken time off in so long so I took that time off it's the first time she's honestly ever told me anything like that normally she's like no you can do this you can push through but that time I think she was like okay this kid needs a break like she's 18 she can calm down a bit yeah you might have scared her a little bit eh yeah, seriously. <laughs> so I, I have enjoyed over the last couple of years watching you and Bianca uh, Andrescu become friends. Um, and I, I like, how important is that to you? Honestly, I didn't expect us to connect really like we did. And she would say the same, I think. Initially, it almost felt like it was a forced connection. Like, okay, we have to hang out because we are who we are. 
Penny Alexiak and tennis superstar Bianca Andreescu were introduced to each other in late 2019. Hey, Bianca! Hey. Two teenage champions. They started making appearances together, including on then Raptor Serge Ibaka's cooking show. Christmas is here. Not bad. Ooh, baby. From that forced connection, as she puts it, grew a real friendship and real conversations about sports and expectations and dreaming big. She would come to my apartment like every day to hang out and everything. And it's just super nice to have someone I can totally relate to you and you can just go to them and talk to them about something like media or fans or pressures or things like that. And they'll automatically understand you and you'll just be like, yeah, no, I totally get that. I've been there. It's just super nice to have that. And you have somebody else who gives you solid, solid advice about swimming. <laughs> Every night, Michael Phelps rewrites history. And that's Michael Phelps. Yes. I started working with his brand Phelps and I went to a photo shoot in San Diego, I think it was. And I was able to go to him whenever I really wanted to through text or calls. And he would give me a lot of advice, which is super awesome. Kind of like, I honestly go to him as my like last resort of when I'm really thinking about something serious, I'll get a lot of opinions from people that are really close to me. And then I'll go to him and be like, okay, I need to know, like, what would Michael do pretty much? Michael Phelps and Bianca Andreescu standing by. Her family always ready with advice and lots of time to absorb it. The year-long delay in the Olympics, even with its disrupted training rituals, has had its curious gifts. My boyfriend and my best friend were living with me at my apartment at the time. Like, as soon as quarantine hit, I was like, let's all live together. <laughs> And we just did things like we've never really had the time to do. We were working out, we were eating good food. It was really fun. You probably really, really needed that. I think I did, honestly. Sorry, it's been really hard for you. I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know it had been that hard. No, I don't think anyone really knew, honestly. <laughs> like I think the only people that may have really known was like my parents, but other than that, not really. Is there something you want Canadians to, to know and be thinking about when they see you this summer? I think I just want them to realize how hard the like Canadian swim team and the relay girls that are probably going to be on the relay this summer have trained and how much work we've put in through all of this. And we've made so many adjustments, being told a million different things. We've been told we're going to compete so many times this year and we haven't been able to compete once. No one knows what to expect of us, but hopefully they're impressed by what we do this summer. <laughs> Listen, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Just look after yourself, okay? Amazing. Thank you so much. And we will have special Olympic coverage all next week leading up to the official start of the Games. Adrian Arsenault is on the ground in Tokyo and you can catch Andrew Chang hosting Olympic coverage every afternoon from 12 to 6 p.m. Eastern. It all starts Friday, July 23rd with the opening ceremony. Adrian will be hosting alongside Olympic primetime host Scott Russell and special guest Mark Sakamoto. That starts at 6.30 a.m. Eastern on CBC TV, CBC News Network, and CBC Gem. Next on The National, most Canadians have access to internet, but it's a different story for Indigenous youth. Our young people get left further and further behind. We'll tell you what some Indigenous startups are doing to fix the issue. Stay with us. There's a digital divide in this country between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And a new report says that gap is widening. As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, it says barriers to accessing online skills could affect the financial futures of Indigenous youth. Demand for Mallory Yongwei's subscription box of Indigenous-made products is booming. I feel gratitude for my community, the, the greater Indigenous community uh, across Turtle Island who've allowed me to champion their businesses. Yangwei says her entrepreneurial drive came from her parents and the Satellite Cree Nation where she grew up, but her skills to launch an online business did not. 
I come from, um, from a reserve where we have very poor internet access. E-commerce, business, mathematical skills, logistics, all of that was so, so completely the opposite. Three quarters of households in Indigenous communities don't have access to high-speed internet. RBC surveyed 2,000 Indigenous youth and found they were 13% less likely than non-Indigenous youth to describe themselves as having enough digital skills to thrive. Our young people get left further and further behind and it, it, it exacerbates the issue of um, young people leaving, leaving our communities. To help prevent that, They're Keith Matthew says his community, Simp First Nation, paid $175,000 to install high-speed internet infrastructure. It was probably the best investment we made. So this space is pretty incredible because you can do all kinds of animation. In Winnipeg, a new Indigenous media lab wants to expand access to emerging technologies from virtual reality to 3D printers, laser cutters and green screens. It provides people the opportunity to dream, to think about what's the potential of the future and where they can push it. Yangwei hopes Indigenous youth will see her running a business and know it's possible for them too. We're natural entrepreneurs. We are the original supply chain of this entire continent. How to get more youth to follow is a challenge that could pay off for the entire economy. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Now with more vaccinations and fewer restrictions, it is time to face a return to regular workplaces. While a lot of companies say they'll let employees work from home, at least some of the time, Diane Buckner explains that hybrid model may have a downside. Carlos Seo is happy with his home office setup. It cuts down the commute time, that's for sure. So, um, you know, you do have sort of more hours in your day. He had been hesitant to take advantage of the workplace flexibility his employer offered prior to the pandemic, but now he's on board in a big way. I think I'll be at, the, at home probably two to three times a week. Working from home has proven to be incredibly popular. Statistics Canada says 80% of those surveyed say they would like to work at least half of their hours from home once the pandemic is over. But that doesn't mean all offices will only be half full. We're fully leased uh, with the first tower and we have a substantial pre-lease in place for the, for the second building. This brand new 3 million square foot development in Toronto is attracting plenty of tenants with amenities such as a fancy food court and a gym. That's what people don't necessarily have when they're working at home. Business is a team sport and it's difficult to play with only part of the team. But this CEO says employees who opt to work from home, even part time, could find it a career limiting move. There's the old saying 90 percent of success is showing up. An American study of career success at a U.S. tech firm, pre-COVID, found that the more often someone worked from home, the less likely they were to see pay increases. We are competing for rewards, a limited amount of promotions and salary increases. And there is a stigma associated with using flexible work practices. I think the professional... Carlos Seo has no worries good. about how working from home may affect his career. I think we'll all be on a level playing field regardless of, um, you know, how often each individual uh, comes into the office. He says the pandemic proved people can be productive anywhere, and he hopes that stigma against working from home is outdated. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, this London man is hitting the streets with a distinct set of wheels. I saw a lot of phones out. The reaction to his banana bike is next in our moment. John Deeks from London, Ontario has spent the past two years piecing together this bright yellow velomobile. On Saturday, the bike finally made its debut in the streets. The two-year process and head-turning debut is our moment. It's a type of recumbent bike, and there was a company for several years that was making them. Someone had bought, at the end of that company, they'd bought a body that had never been built up before. It's a fiberglass body. A lot of them are, are in bright orange, and I'm lucky enough to get the banana colored. So I bought the body. I think they are really neat vehicles. And so this was an opportunity to be able to get one and sort of build it myself. I've been sort of working on it off and on over the last couple of years. 
got far enough that it's rideable and I took it out on Saturday and it's kind of blown up ever since then. I saw a lot of phones out when I when I took it for a ride on Saturday. It got a lot of attention then. That was a lot of fun riding down there and lots of smiles and waves and it was neat. It's a regular bike. It's just very unusual looking. This is just a little passion project. This is just my vehicle now for getting around town and, uh, and having some fun with. Okay, I only learned this today, full disclosure, that a Velomobile is an enclosed human-powered vehicle. There's no motor, it's just John, and he has a battery and run brake lights and all of that, but what will he think of next? That is it here for July 13th. This is The National. Good night.